Okay. So um, again, welcome to the Art Teachers Art Club. Happy New Year. Um, I am I am very excited to continue this. Um, it has been very successful. We've been doing trying to average at least once a month with a session, maybe twice, depending on whether I can stalk somebody enough on Facebook to volunteer and um, run a session for an interesting project that I find. And um, Annie is my, my latest victim. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her, her post for Glue Batik and I just, I, I contacted her right away and she was very excited. Um, so we usually run about an hour and a half uh, maybe less, depending on, on how the session goes. I'm going to hand it over to Annie. And if anybody has questions at the end, um, feel free to ask or put anything in the chat. And if I see questions, I can let Annie know um, that there are questions. So um, without further ado, welcome, Annie. Yay! Thank you. So I am going to say that probably the best way to view this would be, I actually have two Zooms going right now that will say Annie Monahan. If you can find both of those, and if you hover over that image, there's three dots in the corner. If you click that, you can push pin video of my um, Zoom videos. Oh, this isn't letting it be side by side. Do you have to change it side by side? Oh, hmm. You can't pin both at the same time. That's I usually do at school, but it's not letting me do that here. Is it letting y'all do that? Pin Let both of see. them. Um, pinning your arm, and then let me find your yeah. face. Huh. Okay, that's weird. I do it at, on my other computer all the time. But Add yeah. pin. There we are. Can you guys see both face and arm pinned? No. Okay, that's fine. If you want to, you can pin either of me right now. <laughs> and then when I actually get started, you'll probably want to pin the one that shows my um, arm in the board. But um, I'm going to go ahead and, okay, sorry. Some For pinning, it just means that if you hover over someone's block, like the, um, the image of me, in the top right corner, there should be three white dots if you click that there's an option that says pin video and all that does is make that video the big one that you're looking at but um we can well, either way whether or not you can see me you can hear me right now and then we'll get that figured out after i'm done with the little introduction so um first off giant thank you for reaching out to me i'm really excited i love opportunities to do stuff like this especially since this year all the like national and state art education conventions haven't been happening. So any opportunity to connect with fellow art teachers just is but just tickles my fancy, makes me so excited. So um, my name is Annie Monahan. I currently teach at Hawken Middle School in Cleveland, Ohio, and I live in Lakewood, Ohio, right outside of Cleveland. Um, I'm pretty new here. I moved from Asheville, North Carolina, where I lived for the last 13 years. And uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited. I love teaching art. The past six years, I taught pre-K through fifth grade. And I thought I was never going to teach another age group. I was like, these kids are the best thing ever. And now I'm teaching middle school and I just love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, this project that I'm going to be teaching to y'all is one that I've taught from all grades, um, like first grade through eighth grade. So it's definitely that can be adapted for different ages and um, easily can be done with high school or college or any age, really adults or anything like that. But um, just like with all projects, you are art teachers, you're creative, you already know this, but this is something that can easily be um, adapted for different age groups or people with... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, kids who need extra support and stuff like that. So um, on the little flyer that went out, it said some of the materials. Some of you are probably doing this with me. Some of you maybe are just taking notes or watching and might do this later. Um, I told Steph that tomorrow I will send her like a kind of lesson plan document too that has all this information. Uh, so you'll have, you'll get that information later as well. But basically, the materials are pretty simple. All you need is something like cardboard or something sturdy that you can like tape and work on. 
Um, you're gonna need white paper, a marker. I like to use Sharpies. Um, you need saran wrap, uh, tape, and then you need blue gel glue, and then you need some sort of fabric dye or acrylic paint. Um, and the specific project that I'm showing you today, I'm doing a radial symmetrical design. Um, I, it sounds like a few people started their designs before this, and you can really do whatever design that you want to do. I'm just showing you this specific way that I teach it. Um, yeah, there are a few kind of like rules of the design, which I'll get into in a minute just to help you be successful. Uh, but when I first taught this, I did a radial symmetrical design inspired by, um, oh, I just had a brain fart. What are they called? Rose, is it rose windows? Is yeah. That what yeah, rose windows. And we were studying world religion with my fifth graders. And so we were looking at rose windows and then, I mean, there's mandalas and so many different religions of art. And so that's kind of what inspired this. I've also done this project with insects, with the younger kids where they were studying like, um, they were studying insects and stuff. And so we did bilateral symmetrical designs for that. I've also done, done <laughs> I've done, I have done some observational plant drawings with students and did that for this design. So after I do this, I would love like other ideas that you get inspired by this too. Cause I, I teach this every year to different grades because I think it's really fun to do. And it's one of those projects that I think students feel really successful and get excited about the outcome when they do it. So I'm, this, I often do the radial design ones just cause it's like kind of naturally what I go towards. I love radial symmetry, but I would love to hear other ideas y'all have. So um, I've also done this project on bandanas and this, I don't know if y'all are looking at, oh, the color looks horrible and washed out. This is really bright in real life. Oh, geez. Let me see. I think that's one of the ones I put in the flyer and it looked great. Yeah, that's so crazy. Oh, here, maybe. That looks really oh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> if you're looking at the, um, the document cam, you can see it. it's very bright. And so these, I just actually bought bandanas on Amazon for really very cheap, just white cotton bandanas. And that's what I did these on. I've also made them smaller and they've um, kind of been like a flag almost, you know, kind of like Tibetan prayer flags, how those hang, kind of that kind of style. I've also done a quilt project. So I actually had all my fifth graders do uh, observational plant drawings and do their designs. And then I gave them all the same color palette. So we had all like cool colors, blues and greens. And then after we were done, I actually had a friend of mine sew them into a quilt, which we sold at the auction for our wow. school auction. That's awesome. And I was so sad when we sold it. I was like, can I just keep this forever? <laughs> it was gorgeous. But um, yeah, so all different things that you can do with this. Uh, are there any questions before I go ahead and dive right into how I do this? Um, just a quick question about the, the paint or the fabric dye. Mm -hmm. I bought the Dynaflow. It's a set in little bottles. Do we use that as paint with water to paint it or just yeah, straight yeah. out I of the bottle? You use it with water. And when I get to the painting part, I'm going to talk about that a bit more because I have some different types of paints and dyes here that I've used. So okay. there are tons of different options. But yes, so I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to that part of the process. Great. Thank you. Um, so if you're looking at my face right now, you'll probably want to find the other video of me that has my hand and pin that video. So if you haven't done that already, again, you can look for it's a video of like my arm and go to the top right corner of that picture, push the three buttons and then do pin video and it should make it so that's the biggest video. Or if you turn it to speaker view, that is where my microphone is coming through. So you should be able to see it through there as well. So does anyone need help finding that? Awesome. All right, so again, we're gonna do a radial symmetrical design for this. And so the first thing that we need to do is fold our paper. I'm using a paper that's 12 inches by 12 inches, but really anything works. I usually don't work too small on this. Um, I try to keep it about this size or bigger. Um, but what we're gonna do is start by folding our paper. And all we're gonna do is just fold it in half. What do you call this, hot dog style? <laughs> Increase it. Uh, if it's square, it's, it's, I guess, a burger. 
a hot dog right now, a taco maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and then we're gonna fold it in half again. That's a hot dog, I guess. <laughs> so it's in quarters. And Georgian, Georgian says she hopes you join the Ohio Art Education Association. I know I should do that. I need to. Um, and then at, this is usually the point in the fold when I try to get the students to figure out what what corner is like the middle of their paper. So if you were to open it up, where is the middle of your paper? So I know it's right here. And then I am gonna fold it one more time. So it's like a pyramid. And depending on what age group I'm working with, definitely if I'm working with the younger kids, I would have them at this point, uh, make a little dot on their design in that corner that is the middle of the paper. So I folded it in half three times, one, two, and then three, like a pyramid, and that's where my middle of my paper is. So sometimes with the older kids, I have them make that dot too. I think that's just helpful, you know. And I'll give you a second for those of you who are following along. Okay, are we ready? Do we want another minute? Okay. So the reason that I have them make that dot in the center is just so that when you're creating your design on here, you're kind of being thoughtful about what part of the design is gonna be the center, right? So when I showed you this, you can imagine that if this was folded into quarters, and then into eighths, that this is where my center is. And so when I was doing my design, I was just kind of imagining that my design was coming out of this corner, kind of radiating outwards. That's how I get the kids to remember the word radial symmetry. It's radiating outwards. And so when I'm creating my design, there's no like wrong or right way to do your design, but you do want it to like keep in mind that this is the center. So if you wanted like a circle in the center of your design or some sort of a um, specific thing in the center, that would be where you want to put it. Kind of the rules that I give the kids when they're drawing about doing their design is that you don't want any of your lines to be closer than like a finger width apart. So what I mean is, as you look on this, between this white line and this white line, there's about a finger width the space. Um, you know, obviously they're gonna end up, some of the lines will run into each other, so they'll get smaller. But I really in, try to encourage students to not create a design that's super intricate or any really tiny details, because we are gonna be tracing our design with glue later, and you know how glue spreads? If you're making designs that have really small details, it's just gonna turn into a blob. So you wanna keep your pieces kind of like, or your lines really spaced out. I also say, I also tell the kids that it's gonna start in this corner, whatever design you have, and whatever lines or shapes that you do need to come off of, or need to like hit the side of the paper. And then I usually have them try to do something that either goes off the top as well, or something that kind of fills that space. So what I mean is if I'm, and you know what, if you know, if you want to do this with pencil first to practice, obviously go for it just for time and just for um, ease of directions, I'm going to go ahead and just dive right in with Sharpie, but this is the center and I know that. So I'm going to go ahead and actually draw kind of a curve for this design because I know that that will create a circle in the middle. And then I'm just going to start filling it up with a design. I kind of tend to do these kind of I don't even know, Paisley inspired shapes and stuff, just because that's kind of my aesthetic. But I usually encourage the kids if they like more sharp edges and geometric shapes, you know, to do that. Um, I usually have the kids stay away from symbols like peace signs and yin yangs and stuff like that. But obviously that's totally up to you and what you're doing. But as far as my design, I encourage them to have it go off the edges. So what I mean is just the designs just going off the edges.
And again, I'm doing really big shapes. You don't want to get too intricate or anything that's too close to each other. And I, this is definitely one of those things that like, the more you do it, I feel like the, the better they turn out. Um, usually like when I taught it this year to my seventh graders, I actually had them cut up just small pieces of newsprint paper and do some practices so they could kind of have an idea of how it works. Um, I felt like that, that made them feel a little bit more successful when they were actually doing their designs. not really sure how long to give y'all to do each step. Anyone who's doing it with me, could you kind of give me some feedback if you're ready for the next step or if I should wait a minute? This is how I feel in my classroom. <laughs> yeah. Are y'all um, are y'all teaching remote? Yeah. Okay. I I've, I've actually been in person all year, so. Oh, lucky. I've, I've lucky. been very lucky. <laughs> cool. Okay, some people are taking notes, some are doing it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead with this next step actually too, because unless you have a light table at home, this is probably actually going to be kind of hard to do the next step, but um, so basically what we're going to do now is we're going to take our design, and so if this was my design, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the process I usually use to make it go from that one eighth to a whole design. Okay. And so there's multiple ways to do this. Um, when I do this in my classroom, because I only have a couple light boxes and I have a bunch of kids, what I actually have them do is you open your design so it's only folded in half. And then you take the drawing and put it against a window and I'm like trying to see if you can see this in here. No, I guess you would need a light behind it. But you can, even right now, I'm looking at this and I can actually see my design showing through a little bit. But if you put it up to a window, you can see it showing through. And then what you'll do is you'll trace your design onto it. What I'm going to do, let's see if I can bring my document cam over here. Do, 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 do. I have my light table. And so this is my preferred way to do it, but you know, not everyone has a light table at home or in their classroom or whatever. But what you can do, of course, you can't really see on a light table, but I, I can see my design showing through here really easily. And so I'm just gonna trace it. Which I'm doing it really quick right now because it's not very much fun watching someone just trace a bunch of stuff. But um, you can see that after doing one section, when I open it up, already it's in half or in half, it's doubled. And I always go back at the end and fill any of these lines that don't connect. I go ahead and connect those. But then I'm basically going to keep doing that. So I'm folding it in half. And I'm seeing my design. Oh, y'all can kind of see it now. I see my design. I'm putting it on here. I'm tracing it. I got to tell you, it's really, <laughs> it's kind of funny when I do this with the kids because there's always a few kids who just cannot figure out how to get the last like part of their design trace. Like they can't figure out how to fold the paper. Um, and it always is just really funny to me. I'm like, don't let the paper like outsmart you. You got this, you know? Uh, because you end up having to fold it multiple different ways to get your design on the whole thing. But, so again, I know it's not very exciting watching me do this. Do, 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 do. So now I have half of it done. And then now all I have to do is fold it in half one more time, flip it over, 
and trace the whole thing. And if y'all have questions while we're while I'm working on this or doing instructions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask me during the process too. You don't have to wait till the end. That's okay with me. Does anyone have a light table at home or anything so they're able to actually do this step right now? You can also use a traditional tracing paper method. Oh, that's true. Yeah, 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 for sure. See, I never even think of that. I need to like add that to my to my ideas because it really doesn't matter what kind of paper you work on. Yeah, tracing paper is a great idea. Thank you. You're welcome. And so you can imagine how, like when I did this project with um, the younger kids and I did the insects, we, we worked a lot smaller than this, more of a like rectangular flag type shape, but they, I actually had them look at pictures we found online of insects. And then we just drew half of it. And then they just had to fold their paper in half and trace the other half of it. And then when I did the um, observational plant drawings with my students, um, we, it wasn't a radial design. It was just, um, just drawings of the plants. And actually, I have to tell you, I have real light table envy right now. That's gorgeous. The one you have. Well, it belongs to my school. I just, uh, grabbed it and was like, I'm going to borrow this tonight. <laughs> We've all done that too. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Sometimes things find their way back and sometimes they don't. <laughs> I know I would love like a, my own for sure. All right, I'm putting in the chat, I'm putting a, I'm like forgetting how to do things right now. That's a link to my um, website that I have not updated at all in forever, but that specific uh, link actually takes you to my blog post from a few years ago when we did the quilt. So you can kind of see um, how this could be done, you know, differently and a lot smaller and stuff, but to kind of get a visual of that as well. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, my puppy is licking my leg. He's like, mom, hang out with me. Okay. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I can put that link in the lesson document for sure. Great. All right, I'll give y'all a minute for if anyone is doing this or whatever. And then, like I said, what I always do at the end too, I don't know how much this matters. Some of you can probably just visualize this anyway, but when I'm doing this with kids, especially, I have them go back and like connect anywhere where the lines don't connect together. Because, you know, some of the shapes end up getting a little, a little weird looking, so. And, yeah. And I'm going to add something to the center of mine too, because I think that looks a little weird. Okay. So if you want me to wait until the next step, you're welcome to unmute and let me know or type it in the chat and I'll wait a minute. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next step for y'all. Okay, so the next step is that um, you need something that you can tape this on and leave it on for a few days because um, I should have said this at the beginning, but this is actually a project that takes three days. I'm still going to walk you through the steps because I actually already did it ahead of time, you know, at the different um, stages so I can show you. But this is something that takes three days and so, or three class periods or whatever. So you do need something hard that you can attach it to that it can stay attached to. Um, sometimes obviously in a classroom storage can be an issue, but 
I've um, put them on cardboard and put them on drying racks, or I just like put them anywhere in the room I can find to store them because um, we are going to put glue on them so they can't be like touching or stacked with other ones. But okay, the next step is that on whatever you have, um, I'm lucky enough to have these nice boards in my classroom, but in my last job, I didn't. And so we just put them on cardboard and that worked totally fine too. But um, so we are going to go ahead and tape this down now. And if you use clear tape, it doesn't really matter how you tape it down. But if you're using masking tape or something darker, probably just try to tape it down so that you're not covering up the design. Um, yeah. And I am, I'm definitely that type of teacher who's like, eh, whatever, just use whatever you have. Like, I'm not a perfectionist and I'm pretty flexible about that kind of stuff. So, you know, but I just try to, if the kids are taping it themselves, I just encourage them to tape it so that it's nice and flat, you know, it's not poofed up on the table or anything like that or on the cardboard or whatever you're using. Okay, and then the next step is actually to cover this with saran wrap. And I actually, when I first started doing this project, used wax paper instead. But as you know, wax paper has like a little bit of a, um, it's it has a, it's not completely transparent. And so it's a lot harder to work for, with, through that. So basically what I do is I just cover this with saran wrap and tape it down. Um, my saran wrap's not big enough to cover the whole thing. So I'm gonna end up needing two pieces. And, oh, I did it too small. You want to do it big enough so that it covers it and goes off the edges a little bit, especially if you're doing your paper bigger, or if you're doing your fabric bigger than your paper, which is what I am going to be doing. And I'll explain that when I get there. But um, and as you know, saran wrap is super fun to uh, uh, <laughs> pass out to a bunch of students. So I usually try to have them ripped and ready to go before the kids get there. <laughs> But, and the same thing is with the paper, you want to make sure it's kind of tight so it's not like uh, wrinkled and sticking up and stuff. And the reason that we're putting the saran wrap on there, some of you probably already figured this out, but is because we are going to be adding fabric and glue. And if the glue goes through the fabric, which it will, it would stick to your paper. But with saran wrap, it's not going to stick to anything. So. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so if we've already done our design on the fabric, we don't need the saran wrap. We could just glue, put, do the glue directly to the fabric. Did you draw it on the fabric? Yes. I don't know if that would work. I've never drawn it on the fabric because I think, what did you draw it with? A pencil. Um, I don't know. I mean, it will work, but I think you'll still see the pencil. Okay. So I always do it like this because then your design is just white and there's no pencil marks or anything like that. Okay. Um, you're welcome to give it a try. And if it works, let me know. Cause that would definitely skip a step, but um, yeah, I've never done that. So. All right. So I'll just pause where I am. Yeah, I mean, it will, it would definitely work. I just think you'd see the pencil lines through afterwards. And then the last step after the saran wrap is our fabric. And the way that I get the fabric lined up is I have the students take the fabric, fold it in half, give it just like a little crease with your fingernails and then fold it the other way and give it a little crease with your fingernails like in the middle part because I don't know how well you can see it because my fabric's quite wrinkly anyway. Oh yeah, you can see that. But now there's that nice fold in the middle. And what I can do is take that and line that up with my the center of my batik before I tape that down. Or the my design, not my batik. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna tape this down. And so I usually make sure and use plenty of tape on this one. I've had, sometimes I'll actually tape all the way around the corner. So it creates like a little border, um, which actually is kind of cool. Cause that, that means when you're using the dye, it leaves like a white border around the outside, which like matches your design. But I usually don't do that. I just usually 
kind of tape the corners down and then put a couple extra pieces of tape. You want to make sure this is attached really well, though, because once you start, you do not want your fabric moving. If y'all are able to, I would love if y'all could type in the chat too, if you've been like remote or in person this year or hybrid or whatever, teach, I'm just curious. Oh yeah, someone asked about washing the fabric. Yes, definitely. I usually wash it first if I'm able to. Um, with the bandanas I did this year, I didn't just cause of like time and stuff. But yeah, if you're able to, and I just buy white, just like honestly, whatever's cheapest, like, cotton fabric or bandanas. I'm sure that there are certain kinds of fabrics that work better or worse, but I've never bought a fabric that didn't work for this. So I usually try to find something that's um, pretty easily see-through too. If you buy something that's really thick, it'll be a lot harder to see through. But it sounds like mostly remote and hybrid. I have been in person all year. Yes, muslin is awesome. That works great. I was I was teaching remotely for just a couple weeks in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Otherwise, we've been in person all year. And um, obviously, there's a little bit of worry connected to that. But it's been amazing. Oh, sorry. My dog's chewing on something. Give me just a second. Naughty. Yeah, you're naughty. Naughty, naughty, naughty. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so this next step is my personal favorite, <laughs> but basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be tracing our design and glue. Now, here's the thing. Um, I know that there is, there are other techniques to do this. Obviously there's wax fatigue, which I am not comfortable doing with students. And I've heard a lot of other teachers feel the same way. Um, I've also used just like the clear Elmer's glue and it works, but I do think that this works a lot better. Um, it works better because when it comes out, it doesn't spread as much and it seems to come out of the fabric easier. Um, this, I've seen this, like sometimes I see this at Michael's or Joann's and places like that, but I usually either order it online or Oddly enough, I actually see this at grocery stores a lot <laughs> and I love this glue. So whenever I see it at like a grocery store or something, I just like take like five or 10 of them and just buy them. So I have them. Um, yeah. And so what I tell the kids about tracing over your design is a couple of really important things. First is that you want to make sure that when you're working, you don't drag your hand or your shirt or anything like that over it because what's going to happen is it's going to smear and you can't erase glue, right? So if you make a mistake like that, it just is kind of a happy accident and you have to just deal with it um, or adapt, you know, to change your design or whatever. That rarely happens though. I think maybe it's because I just put a lot of emphasis on that, but telling the kids they can't erase glue seems to make them like, oh yeah. Um, but what I usually do is I usually take the top and open it all the way and then turn it back a little bit. And I always have the kids practice on some newsprint or scrap paper or whatever you have first, um, just so you can kind of get an idea of what it feels like when it comes out. Um, I like to hold it like I hold a pencil, just kind of on an angle and squeeze it and drag. And when I do it, I have it touching the paper and I just kind of pull it away from the glue. Actually, I need to open that a little more. Oh. But I definitely have kids who hold it like this. Oh, you can't see. Hold it above the paper and just kind of squeeze it and drag it. I usually tell them not to do that, but it does seem to work for some kids. The younger kids do have a harder time squeezing the bottle. Um, so they just kind of figure out what works best for them. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say about the design. I forgot to say this earlier. Um, when you're doing these designs, if you have students who just kind of need a little extra support or are having a hard time with their designs, or if you just want to do this project like really quick, um, I've done this before too, where I, I let some students pick pages out of like coloring books, really simple 
designs and they can use that as their design instead. So, you know, just a thought if you're trying to adapt your lesson for, um, you know, different students. But anyway, I think practicing on the newsprint is a really, really good idea. And once they've practiced a little bit, you know, get rid of that and then you can start doing it, gluing it on here. Now, as far as gluing, like I said, if your hand smears the glue, you can't erase it, it's stuck there. So my suggestion is I start at the far corner and I slowly work down and towards myself until I have the whole thing filled up. Now, as far as doing your design, try to do a design and you gotta work pretty slow. It's a slow process. I mean, for me, it's a slow process. I've definitely have students who finish this in like five minutes and I'm like, what, how did you do that? But <laughs> um, I do it pretty slowly and you can see I'm, maybe you can see, kind of can see, I'm like pushing and dragging it. And if it starts coming out really like blobby, um, you probably need to either go slower or open your, open or close your glue. You know, it's kind of about figuring out what works for you. That's why I have the kids do it on the paper first. Um, I'm not perfect at this and I've done this like a bazillion times. I still end up getting like blobs of the glue or places where the glue actually separates and it creates like dots almost. I tell the kids just to go back and don't squeeze the glue bottle, but just kind of draw over it to bring that design back together. And what's so, the drying time on it? What's that? What's the drying time on it? I wait until the next class. So I wait till, you know, the next day or the next week or whatever. I don't know, like technically what it is. It probably depends on how warm it is in your classroom, you know, but right. yeah, I always wait until the next class. It's always ready by the next day though, for sure. And some, I always try to get students to not like fill in shapes. I've had students who, you know, draw a circle and then they color the whole circle in with glue. That's really hard to get it off if you get the glue off if they do that. So I really encourage students to not do like spaces and just stick to doing, um, or do outlines, don't fill in shapes. And I'm curious, is anyone doing this with me? Because I don't want to spend a ton of time with you just like watching me. Okay, so some people are doing it with me. So I'm going to keep tracing mine for a little while. I do have one ready to go for the next step, but um, since it sounds like there are some of you doing it with me, I'll work on that a little bit. And yeah, this is just a, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Obviously, if you're doing it with your students, they might only be doing it once, but... I think it's super fun, even for the students that have a hard time kind of holding the glue bottle. That's why they might end up doing two hands. You know. Has anyone ever done this project with, um, yeah, for sure. Someone said use a toothpick or old pencil point to connect the open spaces, for sure. I, would, I wouldn't probably use a pencil just because I'd be afraid I'd accidentally draw on my um, design and you would see that, but yeah, toothpick's a great idea for sure. Has anyone done this project with like the, the toothpaste or baking soda or any of the other techniques? I have not, but. Oh, and what I was gonna say too, is if you do your paper, or sorry, if you do your fabric larger than your paper, which is what I often do with the kids, I let them um, do like a freehand pattern around the outside if they want to, or just draw like a, um, a border around it. Or you could just leave it like it is, you know, whatever you're going for. This, the most recent time I did it this year was seventh graders. It was for a class I was teaching called wearable art. And so ours were like bandanas. And so I actually had them, you know, look at bandanas and do a design around the outside as well too. So. What's the general time frame for the projects from beginning to completion? Uh, I mean, it depends on how big you're working, you know? I usually do um, a day of practicing drawing designs. So where they're, you know, using newspaper or newsprint or just like working smaller and practicing. So they get an idea of how the symmetrical designs work. And then I usually do one day of them doing their final project and getting all their materials taped down and ready to go. And then a class of tracing. Some kids end up needing two 
kids tracing or two classes to trace depending on how fast they're working and how big the project is and then I usually do two days of the painting and then after that you need one day to wash it out but I'll talk about that when I get there too some people sometimes depending on how old the kids are I'll do it at home myself and I'll kind of give you some tricks of how to do that and sometimes I have the kids do it themselves so it kind of depends there's a lot of like factors too depending on what kind of paints you're using and stuff like um with one of the kinds of dyes I use sometime after the before you wash it out you have to iron it so that adds like another step too so it just kind of depends on what you're using and I'm going to keep working on this for like two more minutes and then I'll go ahead and go to the next step because even if you are working on yours right now with me, I realize you're not gonna be able to do the next step anyway till it's dry. So I might as well just go ahead. So I have the kind of dye that you also have to iron. Mm -hmm. So when you, before you, so how do you iron it and not get the glue? Yeah, so what I do is I, do the glue like I'm doing now, let that dry completely, do the dye, let that dry completely. And then I put wax paper over it and iron it. And okay. um, you don't have to iron it for super long, I figured out. So, I mean, obviously, well, maybe not obviously. I don't know why I keep saying obviously. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get that word out of my um, vocabulary because it's not a great word. But uh, with the with the ironing, yeah, you only have to iron it for a short time. So it doesn't actually like pull out any of the glue or anything. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Do you iron it on the front or on the back? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't even know that I thought about that when I was doing it, to tell you the truth. Okay. I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who's like a perfectionist and has everything down. I'm like, I'm like the person who opens a cookbook and I'm like, oh, that looks good. I'll kind of make that, but also add whatever else I want to it. So also the like- It just says set by ironing. And, yeah. that, and then it's washable, but it, you know, it's not taking into account the glue, the glue thing. Yeah. And I've, I've only done it with the dye a couple times. I like the dye a lot better because of how vibrant it turns out. Um, but I only set it for just a couple minutes on each one. And then um, it didn't come off when I washed out. Yes. And I'll talk about the glue in a minute for or the glue and all that stuff in a minute. So I'm actually going to go to the next step. Um, Unless anyone has any questions about this step specifically about the glue. I have a question. Yes, please ask. Uh, I'm still working on um, getting my drawing copied from one section to the next. Okay. But after that, when do you use the marker? After you've got the design in the four boxes equally, you go over it all? Yeah, I usually, I usually have them draw once, just their practice. Wait, let me show you. I usually, when they draw their first section, I usually have them draw that in pencil. And then when they have a design they like, then they trace it with Sharpie. And then when I'm doing all of the sections and retracing them with my light board or whatever, or light box or whatever you're using, I actually do that all with Sharpie. So that way they don't have to trace over it again. I always have a couple students who want to do it in pencil because they don't like, you know, they're scared about using the Sharpie, but I don't think, that's, you know, that'll be up to you. I, I usually just do it all in Sharpie myself, but. But the point is that if you have it done in Sharpie, you can see through the, the fabric. Exactly. Because it's black yeah. Sharpie. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. you for asking that clarifying question for sure. Yeah. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions at this step or about anything I've said so far? And Okay, and Georgie, and I saw your question, and I will about the um, ironing, and I'll get there in a minute as well. All right, I'm gonna move this and get my other one out. Give me a second. Nancy also mentioned that she used watered down acrylic to paint it. Yep, that's what I've. Um, that's what I used to use. And um, all right, so. And I'll get there in just a second. So this is the one I did yesterday. So it's all dry and ready to go. So I glued it and you can, I guess you probably can't see, but I can feel that um, 
Nope, Nancy, I'm glad you asked that question. That's what I was just going to say is when you, when you do it originally, it does, it like sits on top of the fabric. It's like a little bubble of glue almost. And then when it's dry, it totally soaks into the fabric, which is great because that means it's going all the way to the other side of the fabric, which is going to create a um, resist. This design is going to become your resist that goes all the way through the fabric. Yeah. So right now this is like super flat. It's not bubbly or anything like that because it's dry. Okay, so let's talk about paints and dyes and stuff. So there are a bunch of different things that you can do as far as the um, adding the paint can go. What I did for years was I seriously just went to like Walmart or Michaels or whatever and bought very cheap craft acrylic paint. These are like 30 cents a bottle. Um, these definitely work and there are different ones. You know, if you go to Walmart or Michaels or whatever, there are different brands. And some of them actually say like fabric paint, some say acrylic paint. It doesn't really matter as long as they are like acrylic or fabric paint. You don't want to use any sort of like tempera paint because that will wash out. Um, but what you do with these paints is you are going to mix these with water. So what I usually do when we're when we're in person and there's no such thing as COVID, when kids can share supplies and stuff, I usually mix up a bunch of colors, set them around the room, you know, and then the kids can like grab whatever colors they want. Um, what I do though, is I put this in a cup and I put probably one part of this and like two parts water usually. And I just mix it up really well. There's no, like I said, I'm not, I'm not a really like particular specific person. It's just kind of figuring out, you want it to be like soupy, but you don't want it like so thin that it like bleeds everywhere. And so again, this, I would highly recommend if you do this with your students to do some practice ones first and use different kinds of paint to see um, how well they work. I've also noticed that purple is like the color that almost always comes out. I don't know what it is about purple dyes and purple paint and stuff like that, but almost all the purple colors I've used wash out. So that's just kind of an interesting thing I found. So this is probably like the maybe cheapest way to do it. What I've started using is the Dynaflow, which I ran out of those, so I don't have any of those bottles with me, but there's also these two kinds of um, textile, dye, which is also, how do you say that? A jacquard? Is that how you say that? Um, <laughs> the jacquard, this is just textile color. And this one is called Neo Opaque and it's a light body opaque curlic. Both of these work and the Dynaflow work. When you open these, you'll see that they're pretty thick. They are like the consistency of like a, um, a curl, even like a thick acrylic paint. And so you really have to water these down as well. And so yeah, so I usually, what I did this year um, is I actually used, oh, where'd it go? Sorry. Oh, there it is, okay. What I did this year with my students, since they can't share supplies, is I bought a bunch of these little just like plastic ramekin things at a kitchen store for pretty cheap, and they're like you know, what people use for like jello shots or to go condiments or whatever. And I actually mixed up just a ton of these and then students used what they needed and then put the top back on and put it in like a sanitized later pile. And then I sanitized them and they could use them again for the next class, like just sanitize the outside of them. So these y'all, anyone who's in person, these or even remote, these things have saved my life this year <laughs> for distributing supplies for a lot of kids as far as paint and stuff like that. But what you're gonna do is when you're ready to use your colors, like I said, you wanna water it down. I'm gonna actually go to the kitchen. I didn't wanna have water over here because I was afraid I'd spill it on my computer or something. But, oh wait, never mind. I'm just kidding. I have water over here. Um, but what I do is just grab like a blob of this and put it in my container, whatever I'm using, and then just, I don't know if y'all can see this, I guess it doesn't matter, but I'm adding a little bit of paint and then, you know, just swished around and I'll show you when it gets to a like good consistency. So you can see kind of like the thickness. Hey. 
So you can test the, what's it called? The viscosity, is that the right word of it? By getting it on your paintbrush and kind of rubbing it on the side of your glass jar. And if it isn't super clear, it's probably pretty good. But if it's looking really clear, you might need to add more paint. Or if you kind of, you know, touch it on the side and it's really thick, you'll add more water. I don't know. I'm sure there's like a one part to two parts or whatever, but I don't know. But once you have your colors all mixed up, you're just gonna paint on your design. Um, one of the questions that I get most often is, do I paint over the glue? And my question or my answer is, if you're using just one color of paint or you're kind of doing something more like a tie-dyed almost design where it doesn't, like you're not trying to get specific areas filled in with specific colors, you could just cover the whole thing in paint. So like if I wanted to paint this whole thing purple, I could do that and then all of the glue lines would end up white and I'll talk about that in a minute. But if you're trying to just fill in specific areas, like specific shapes, what I do is I paint in that area and make sure that the paint like touches the glue, but it doesn't necessarily need to cover the glue because if you go completely over the glue with your dye and then you use another color of dye next to it, the dyes will, you know, spread like watercolor paint and will um, blend together, which sometimes is cool. But, you know, if you put like complementary colors next to each other and they blend, they're going to make some crazy brownish color or whatever, which I like, but kids don't usually like. So, <laughs> um, and as far as the painting, you know, just a little tip. Um, if a student is using purple or whatever, like I am now, I usually try to encourage them to paint everything that they're going to paint that color, you know, and then get another color just kind of depends on how you're working. Um, I also just kind of a personal preference, but I usually try to have the kids stick to like five colors or less. Um, just as far as having a simplified palette, but that's just kind of my aesthetic, you know, depends on what you're working on. Uh, let's see, are there any questions now about any of the dye or anything like that that I've said? Somebody asked if you have to water down the Dynaflow. Um, I can't, I'm trying to think. So you, Steph, you said you bought some of the Dynaflow, right? Um, I bought a set. It comes with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine colors. Wow, that's awesome. Have you opened them yet? I have not, um, but it said it's it's a, a paint that acts like a dye. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I don't feel like I watered down the Dynaflow, but I ran out of mine and don't have any here. I So I'm not looking at it right now, but I feel like the Dynaflow was really watery, and so I didn't have to water that down. Oh, so y'all can actually see right here where I'm pointing that I my purple actually did spread out into there because I just put too much on there, whatever. Oh, well, happy accident, you know, so <laughs> I'll either paint the outside around it purple as well, or just whatever, leave it. And um, another thing is if you are teaching this the way that I'm showing you with a radial design, I also really encourage the kids to paint in a radial design as well. You know, if I'm painting it purple here, I'm gonna paint all the circles around it purple. Uh, just to create that kind of radial design as well. Um, and then a couple other things about the ironing again. You only need to iron it if you buy a, a paint or dye that says you have to um, iron it to set the dye. So like if you're using a craft acrylic paint or something like this, you do not need to iron it. But these ones specifically say in the directions that you have to iron it. So that's only something you'd have to do if that specific dye says to iron it. Um, so like I said, this year I used these and I used Dynaflow with my students. So they needed to be ironed. So what I did, I actually did it myself. I just put on a movie in my classroom, like after school one day and just did them. And I only have one iron. So that would have taken forever for the kids to do it. But um, I just, I just left them taped down. I put a piece or er, yeah, I put a piece of wax paper over top of it and just, and then an extra piece of fabric and just went to town. I would, if y'all have other ways that you would iron it, please tell me, like, I'm not by any means saying that's the best way to do it. I'm just saying that's how I did it. Um, I opened yeah. the package 
and it says that Dynaflow requires heat fixing by ironing for at least three minutes on the reverse side. Okay. Or through a piece of paper or sheer fabric at the hottest temperature. Yeah. And so I did it through another piece of fabric. I put a piece of wax paper, which you do need to use wax paper when you're ironing this because of the glue, it'll just stick to your iron. But um, so I did wax paper, another light piece of fabric, and then I ironed over top of that. So that's good to know you should do it on the reverse side. Yeah, well. definitely. So yeah, I guess just read the directions. It just totally depends on what you're using. Um, I actually will tell you that I think that the this textile paint, it might actually be the cheapest way to go because one of these is, I want to say five or six dollars for one of these, but you really need just a tiny, tiny bit of the um, stuff mixed with the water to fill a lot of space versus this like yes is cheap but you do go through a lot more of this and it's not as like bright so i really i really like these and the dynaflow have been my favorites that i've used and you can get these at dick flick and i don't know i haven't looked at joint fabrics but i'm guessing they probably have something like that there um okay are there any questions about anything i've said so far i'm like after teaching all day and then doing this, I'm like, oh my gosh, am I saying everything? My words are like jumbling together. Am I making sense? <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions about the dying part? Not yet, nope. Okay, so what you're gonna do after your, okay, so another thing actually about the dying is I really encourage students and when I do this on my own, to fill the entire piece of fabric. That means when I get to the where the tape is, like I said, if you did a border of tape all the way around, you could just leave that there and it'll create a white border. But I just have the students like just tear up the tape and then paint underneath it. And then because it, there's the wax paper and really this is attached to the saran wrap because of the glue and stuff, it'll stay in place just fine. But you do want to go underneath the tape as well. My fingernails can't pick it up, but yeah. So I go underneath there and then just like you did with the glue you want to wait at least like overnight or 24 hours before you do the next step um, I usually wait between classes which I have like two or three days between classes you know um, but so after you've dyed it you've filled the whole thing up with dye and you've let it set for at least 24 hours that's when you're going to iron it if you need to iron it and if you don't need to iron it you don't need to iron it but there's a couple different ways to get the glue out of the fabric. And so I know I kind of said this before, but the glue is acting as a resist, right? And so anywhere that you put the glue, your fabric is gonna stay white. Whereas everywhere your dye is, there's gonna be dye on the fabric. And so I have I've done this step so many different ways. So it's just about figuring out what works best for you. When I'm teaching little kids, like when I did the first and second graders and stuff, honestly, what I did is I brought them home and I filled up my bathtub with hot water and I just let them soak in there for like a half an hour, an hour. Um, and after that happens, then you actually take them. Let me see. Let me put the top on there because otherwise I will probably spill that. What you do, just imagine that this is uh, covered in glue and wet. <laughs> but what I do is I just take it and kind of rub it together like this to get the glue off of it. And if it's been soaking for like an hour, it comes off really easily, okay? Um, that's my biggest suggestion of how to do it. If you're just doing your own or you have a really small class or something like that, just putting them in some sort of bucket or something in really nice warm hot water, letting them soak for a little while and then just rubbing it off has been really successful for me. Now, the other ways that I've done it is sometimes the older kids wanna do it themselves. And so if I'm able to, I will get some really hot or warm water before like a half hour before they come to class and like throw them in the water so they're soaking already. And then the kids actually do it themselves. They'll hold them over the sink or over a bucket or whatever and do the same thing, rub it until the glue's out. What I usually end up having to do too is if there's any tough spots where it won't come out, I'll actually take a um, like a dishwashing scrubby thing and like scrub that extra um, glue out as well. Because this glue is washable, 
Um, obviously, well, sorry, I'm trying to get that word out of my vocabulary. You don't want a ton of like big globs of the glue going down the sink, but because you're, um, because you're soaking it in water first, it's fine. You know, would you um, not put it in the washing machine if it's at home? I don't know. I, I have not tried that just because I don't, I'm a little reluctant to put things covered in glue in my washing machine. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm really not sure. Uh, again, if you try it, please tell me, cause that would make things so much easier. <laughs> um, but also, uh, yeah, so, so there's a couple different ways to do it. You know, if anyone else has any other ways that they've done something like this or has any other ways to get the glue out that's worked really nicely, I would love to hear, hear how you've done that. But that just kind of seems to work for me. Oh, you used, oh, good, okay. Cheryl said she used the washer with the blue gel glue and watered down acrylic and it worked fine. Yay. Awesome, okay. yay. So next time I teach this, I will definitely do that because it's a lot easier. I honestly, I don't know. I really enjoy the process of doing it, but I just like am weird and really enjoy certain things. And sometimes it's nice not to have to take your work home, you know? And um, sometimes the older kids actually really, or even the younger kids actually really like scrubbing it out. I think it's really exciting for some of them. So, and then after that, I, you know, you can throw them in the washer and dryer after that. You can hang them up to dry in your classroom or outside, you know, whatever. Yeah. And that's, that's the end of this project. <laughs> and like I said, I'm, I'm in no way like the, the best at this. So I love hearing about y'all's ideas and feedback and stuff like that too. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. It sounds, so it sounds like a few people have said that like doing this in the washing machine would be fine. So I'll have to do that next time. Maybe I would soak them first in water and then put them in my washing machine because my washing machine is not great anyway. But um, yeah, I definitely want to do that next time. And I personally, like for my own art, I really want to start um, doing this on bigger pieces of fabric and making clothes with them because I can never find clothes that is a, like aesthetically what I want. So I want to start making my own at some point. But um, I would love to hear if y'all have any like other ideas for like subject matter or anything like that, just for for ideas. I love hearing other people's ideas. I think this is a great starter idea um, for kids who have never done it before or teachers who haven't done it before too. I'm still working on my drawing. Ooh, that's beautiful. It looks like a mosaic, cool. Um, <laughs> let's see, it looks like there were a couple of questions. Um, I have not used a hair dryer or room fan to dry the glue just because I think that um, waiting that whole 24 hours is probably a good idea just because if there are parts that aren't totally dry, I don't want to like smudge the paint or whatever, but you know, you could try that. Uh, let's see, what kind of fabric did I use for the quilt project? I just used like probably whatever the cheapest white cotton or muslin was that I found. <laughs> oh, that's such oh, that's a, cool a idea. great idea, Georgian. Yeah. Using a color photo, enlarging it, and then tracing it. That's a really fun idea. Oh, that would be so fun to do like portraits or something too. Yes, yes. Oh, can you imagine? Oh, wow. Say that again. I know you blowing up a color photograph and tracing the photograph as even a self-portrait project that way, that would be really cool. That would be awesome. Or even some sort of like uh, Picasso type style portraits might be fun or yeah, one line contour drawings depending on what ages. Liquid wax from ceramic supply stores work, okay. I have never used silk. I know that there are other ways to <clears throat> silk. And I've, I've really wanted to, every time I go to like the national or the state uh, art conventions, I feel like there's always one of the companies that comes in and does like a silk boutique project. And I always want to sign up for it, but I've never been able to for whatever reason. 
Yeah, that's very popular in the free lesson plan parts of the catalogs too. I always see that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so tomorrow I will send Steph an email with my lesson plan and I'll put a link to my website in there. And hopefully now that I'm on the mailing list, I'll come maybe see some of you teach some projects. I'm really excited. Yeah, anybody who wants to volunteer for the next few sessions, although um, I have one coming up on the 28th for Adventures in Abstract Drawing. Um, the chair, senior chair of the NICADA, who is the guy that um, asked me to do this, Mario, is going to actually be teaching his first lesson for us. So um, we're going to be doing that. And then in February, we have um, for the first time with the Materials for the Arts, which is a free organization for, um, oh my God, my brain is... A uh, clearing house for recycled goods. Yeah, thank you. Do you ever lose your words where you know what you want to say yes. and it's just not coming? <laughs> it's not coming. All the time. Um, it's an organization in New York City for where companies drop off all their extra crap and it's wonderful for not it's a nonprofit for our teachers to make an appointment you basically go shopping for free stuff so they are doing a workshop with us i believe it's on the 4th of february yes um reuse sculpture a la louise nevelson oh fun yeah so that's coming up also and um I think that's all I have scheduled coming up. So if anybody has any new ideas and you'd like to discuss with me and set up a, a schedule a session, please let me know, email me back. Um, I will put my email in the chat in case you guys don't have it and uh, let me know. And otherwise I want to thank Annie tremendously thank you so much for this really great lesson You're um, thank you thank you thank you <laughs> thank you thank you and uh stay in touch do your own art for your own sanity wherever you can and um good luck for the second half of the school year thank you so much <laughs> thank, you. thank you for coming. Thank you. This was and great. When, when I send the lesson plan, I'm going to put my email. I would love it if y'all send pictures of either your personal finished pieces or if you do it with your class. I would love to see pictures. That makes me so happy. Great. Thanks again. Good to see everybody. Keep coming back. Have a great night. Good night. Thanks, Thanks again, Annie. Bye, puppy. Bye. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.